Good evening, everyone. My name is Connor Moran. I'm the director of the Wisconsin Book Festival, and I am delighted to be here tonight for our eighth event of the fall celebration. Um, normally, this would be the nine o'clock, a uh, little bit more laid back. Um, I am button my top button for this kind of event. Um, but we are delighted to be hosting Jacob Tobiah for um, their coming of age, uh, coming of age gender memoir, Sissy. Um, this has been a long time coming. We booked this event in February when we thought we would be able to be here in person. Thank you. Um, we are also joined by, oh, it's <laughs> very good as well, uh, by Michonne Taylor, uh, local trans activist and bookseller at A Room One's Own. Michonne, thank you so much for being here. Um, as always, I want to thank Madison Public Library and the Madison Public Library Foundation, their support of free cultural events for the past eight years, but particularly over the past eight months has been intensely unwavering and I can't thank them enough for letting me do this but also for bringing um, these great opportunities to all of us here in Madison and Wisconsin and across the country so um, yeah I just want to say thank you to them uh, I am going to step away and let Michonne and Jacob take the conversation away and I'll see you all at the end yay, yay. <laughs> thank you Connor Ooh, hey everyone, uh, my name is Michonne. I'm here with Jacob Tobiah, who wrote Sissy, obviously. Um, I, I'm gonna do a little bit of an introduction and then a little bit of housekeeping and, or housekeeping and then introduction. Jacob's gonna read, then we're gonna have some questions and we're gonna open up for your questions. So if you have questions for Jacob, type them in the chat or there is a question function somewhere near the bottom of your screen. Um, Uh, yeah, okay, so housekeeping rules. Um, both Jacob and I use they, them pronouns. So if you're referring to either of us um, throughout this event, please use correct pronouns, I'm sure you will. Um, Jacob Tobiah is an actor, writer, producer, and the author of the national best-selling memoir, Sissy, a coming of gender story. From running across the Brooklyn Bridge in high heels to giving Trevor Noah an on-air makeover on The Daily Show, Jacob helps others embrace the full complexity of their gender, even and especially when it's messy as hell. In addition to adapting their book, Sissy, into a forthcoming TV series from Showtime, Jacob recently made their acting debut as a non-binary character, Double Trouble, on Netflix's She-Ra and the Princesses of Power. Originally from Raleigh, North Carolina, Jacob currently lives in Los Angeles, but actually North Carolina because COVID. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad to have you here. I'm so excited to hear you read. So thank you for being here with us, Jacob. Um, I am so stoked to be virtually with everyone in Madison and Wisconsin, the great state of Wisconsin. I am sad to not be there in person because my best friend from growing up in childhood, actually, who's in the book quite a bit, Paige, if you read it's it. It's Paige? Yes, Paige. Yeah, Paige currently lives in Milwaukee. Oh. Um, so I've been to Milwaukee so many times. I've been to Madison briefly, um, and I was fully intending on kind of stumbling onto whatever stage or like podium or whatever it was going to be physically for this book festival. I, I fully intended to stumble to that podium, like pretty beer drunk and definitely in a cheese coma. Like that was my plan. Um, and lo, you know, not all, not all dreams come true. Not um, everything so, is fair. You know, we're just here in this sort of dystopian little digital void together, but I'd like to think that we can make these dystopian digital voids feel intimate and maybe even cute and maybe a little bit even sparkly if we really kind of try. Um, so I'm, I'm so happy to be uh, here with y'all and get a chance to share with everybody. Um, and I'm gonna read because I, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to read from the book tonight. And I decided it was National Coming Out Day recently, which for me, you know, like I, I know that National Coming Out Day holds a lot of the like, deep emotional significance for a lot of people. Um, to me, National Coming Out Day now just kind of feels like the national obligatorily post on Instagram, something about coming out day. You know what I mean? Like it sort of um, has a certain triteness to me that I get grumpy about because I feel like coming out is something we need to, like the idea itself is something that we need to be addressing and untangling and unpacking and thinking about whether or not it still has utility for us. So in the interest of that, um, I'm gonna be reading from the top of chapter four uh, if you have a copy of Sissy already, A plus, overachiever, proud of you. Um, it's on page 101 if you want to read along. I'm, I'm a big believer in doing this like story time librarian style because kindergarten librarian is like my second ideal career if I hadn't ever pulled off selling books. So um, yeah, so we're going to start from there. 
for queer and trans people, life in the closet can be nasty business. It's not just the experience of withholding your identity from people you love, living a half truth while you navigate the world as someone else that is traumatic. It's also the way we talk about that period of our lives, the limiting metaphors we use to structure our self-knowledge. As a kid, I didn't pause for a moment to think about whether the metaphor of, quote, the closet worked for me. I just took the closet as a shameful, for granted part of my epistemological reality. But what's obvious to me now, as an adult, is that this metaphor doesn't allow young queer people to have empathy for ourselves when we aren't yet ready to proclaim our identities to the world. I've come to loathe the idea of coming out of the closet. There's something about its black or white, in or out nature that rubs me the wrong way. And thanks to many queer theory classes in college and the brilliant work of writers like Eve Sedgwick, I'm starting to imagine other narrative possibilities. Instead of the closet, I'd like to propose a more humane metaphor. What if we talk about queer and trans people, quote, coming out of our shells? When you think about it, us queers are a lot like garden snails anyway. We love flowers. We have beautiful curly shells. We are slimy and understand the power of proper lubrication. We have a shiny glittering trail wherever we go. And did you know that most snails are gender neutral and play both male and female roles in procreation? That many snails change gender multiple times throughout the course of their lives. More importantly, when you fuck with a snail, when you make it feel like it's in danger, it'll go right back into its shell. It will protect itself. You'll no longer be able to see its gorgeous, glistening, alien-like body, only a hard shell of its former self. When a person hides in the closet, we act as if it is their responsibility to come out. But when a snail hides in its shell, we don't delegate responsibility the same way. A snail only hides in its shell because the world outside feels hostile. If a snail recoils at the sight of you, it's not because the snail is cowardly or lying or deviant or withholding, it's because you've scared it. When queer people hide our identities, it's not because we are cowardly or lying or deviant or withholding, it's because the world and people around us felt predatory, because someone scared us intentionally or unintentionally, and we are trying to protect ourselves. Like snails, we too are defensive. All this is to say that the metaphors we use to talk about queer and trans experience matter. The closet is a metaphor that sets queer and trans people up to feel that we are somehow dishonest or immoral for concealing our identities, that it is somehow our lack of courage that is to blame. The closet spent over a decade controlling my life and how I thought about myself, making me feel ashamed for hiding my identity from the world and the people around me. The pressure to come out weighed on me constantly. According to what I'd been taught on TV and in books, coming out of the closet was my responsibility. It was my responsibility to open up that door and step bravely into the light. It was my responsibility to correct what the world had assumed about me, that I was straight, that I was a boy, that I was cisgender. I owed it to them, to be honest, not the other way around. And I think we'll just leave it with that. Leave it a little shorter. All right, thank you. It's so... I'm so glad you read this. When I was coming up with questions of what I want to talk to you about, I was thinking a lot about coming out day and how this year it felt like there was a lot of stuff happening on the internet about F that, nobody has to come out. Like we shouldn't have to come out. Um, it's not our responsibility. Um, and yeah, I guess I was just wondering if you could tell us more about your thoughts about coming out in general and anything like that. Yeah, well, um, you know, part of the reason why I felt I, had to write this book in the first place um, is because I just got so exhausted with the reductive ways that I had to, that I was sort of obligated to tell my story in a mainstream media narrative, right? Like, you know, I, I feel like for years I kind of wrote the like thousand to 1500 word, uh, I'm non-binary and here's how I found my power or I'm trans and here's how I found my power essay. And in that, you know, there, there's these tropes that are just so hard to get away from because you only have so many words to sit with people. Um, you only have so much time and so much space. And for me, um, I, I wanted to really take a moment to unpack in this work, both how important um, the idea of coming out was to me and then how, how unimportant it became um, because without, you know, just doing the latter, 
I think it kind of, um, you only get half the weight of the thing because I think it's really important to share like just how earnestly I felt that coming out was, was, was this moral challenge for me. You know, it felt like my gauntlet. It felt like the crucible that my identity needed to make it through in order to be real. Um, and, and then on the back end, as, as, my, as sort of the idea of myself as a gay man really kind of started to disintegrate. And I began to realize like, that's not really covering everything. That's not the whole story here, fuck. Um, you know, like as that process began, all of a sudden um, the sort of transness of the thing really undid uh, the coming out story and the idea of it. Uh, because yeah, there was, there was a point for me and, and I say this later in the book and I almost read this part, but it's kind of long to do in a reading. Um, so you can just get the book and read it for yourself. But um, there is a way in which my, uh, it became irrelevant to come out because I, I did everything, I, I, like I didn't do it in, I did it in reverse after I came out as gay, right? I, I knew myself as a gay person and for years before I was like, okay, I'm gay and, and, and shared that with the world. And then after that, I was like, wow, that really fucking sucked. Like exploring who I was in that context, like in this quiet, silent way was a terrible way to do it. And settling on this language to encapsulate who I am without having the ability to real world test that with any lived experiences is a tr not good way to do that. And so with my gender exploration, I was just like, nah, fuck that. Um, and so it would have been really silly for me to ever kind of come out as non-binary because like what like by the time I would have done that by the time I had language languaged my identity in that way people would have been like well I mean yes darling you're telling us you're non-binary but you're also in lipstick and a dress so like we we kind of figured you know what I mean so I just I think there's all these like ways in which it's it's it, there's these like asyncrasies there's there's just there's so much complication that we don't give ourselves space for with that classic narrative. So I'm done with it. I support you. I believe, yeah, I totally hear you. I feel like there's something really powerful about, for some people sometimes about coming out, about turning something that's been secretive into mm -hmm. something that's public and then being able to turn it into something that's then private, which I feel like has so much less shame than, than secrecy can. Um, but yeah, I think that we should be able to do whatever we want and not have to tell people about it and update them every five minutes. Or maybe, can we just change the branding? Can we just like switch from National Coming Out Day to like National, National Correcting Your Stupid Home, like like cis normative, heteronormative, um, erroneous and ridiculous assumptions about who I am day. No, year. Year. It could be like a, yeah, a national Decade. hobby that spans the rest of eternity. This is the century of correcting your erroneous <laughs> assumptions. Welcome. <laughs> Perfect, yeah. Um, you know, speaking of gender and gender, I'm wondering um, what's bringing you a lot of joy in your gender these days? I know that quarantine has changed how people are uh, working with their gender because people's lives have totally changed. They mm. may not be as public. They may get to have more time at home. They may get to try out new things. And I'm just wondering, like, what's bringing you joy gender-wise right now? Mm. Um, I think right now, uh, What's really bringing me joy is uh, getting in touch with just really the bliss of taking fully queer slutty pics. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I, I was sort of like, is that really the answer? And it's like, it, it yes, it, it very much is. Like I, I posted my first like lewds on my Instagram for the first time ever, which it, for those who aren't familiar with that um, language, lewds are just like nudes light. So they're still very lewd, but they're not like official nudes. You know, they're like safe to post without getting censored, depending on your body type. Also, like, let's be real, the Instagram censorship rules are not fair to yeah. a lot of people of different body types. But I posted my first like lewds where I'm like full ass, butt ass naked and like just fully posting my butt on the internet. Um, and it just felt so powerful. Um, and, and, and it was a photo too, where I was just on a beach. Um, so I didn't have like any trappings of femininity on me. Mm. You know what I mean? Um, and that's part of why it felt so powerful. Because I think 
you know, I, I spend all this time uh, talking about how there is no such thing as a feminine, as an inherently feminine body, right? That there's nothing wrong with the fact that I have like, you know, hair follicles on my chest. They're kind of trimmed because I had an audition where I needed to be like extra androgynous. So like, they're not as fuzzy as they usually are, sorry. But like, you know, that I have hair follicles on my face and hair follicles all over my body that I don't police, right? That I that I am flat chested, but still have breasts, but they're just pretty flat, right? That That I have this body and I still consider it to be worthy of femininity and consider it to be worthy of, of, a, of a type of womanhood um, and, and then a non-binary bliss and something about putting my body without anything else on it, right? With no lipstick, no nail polish, no nothing. And just being like, it's here and I don't have to keep performing this kind of femininity and performing this kind of gender understanding in order for just my body itself to be enough and to be the testament. Um, yeah. And I was like, literally, this just came from posting slutty pics on the beach, right? Like that's, it started as slutty pics on the beach and then it went into like, wow, I'm like deeply addressing my, dis like deeply addressing sort of like this kind of dysphoria that, that, is, that is really interesting and nuanced. And also I'm really working on my dysmorphia by doing that too. Um, it's, it's really helped. Like there's nothing quite like getting a few people sliding into your DMs thirsty after you post your ludes. To also special shout out to our guest performer of the evening who is Luna. Um, we love Luna so much. And um, Luna is, thank you, Luna. She's a hero. <laughs> we talked about me getting rid of her, but then Jacob was like, no, please let her stay. I'm not totally unprofessional, but she we was love, quite cute. We love her. This was, a, this was such an important moment. I'm so sorry. Oh, that's when it is okay too. though, because that's like the queerest thing we could possibly do on this talk. Is like, <laughs> Fuck it up. Puppy who's like, I'm sorry, I need to shake for a sec. <laughs> and then we we're like, okay, shake girl. And then we we're like, okay, we'll talk about the rest of it. But, yeah, let's um, talk about your healing via lose. Oh, but yeah, so so for me, there's something about, uh, yeah, just just like putting my ass on the internet that that really helped me feel better about it, you know? And just kind of, and yeah. And, and so ever since I've kind of like today, I I just was like, I don't know, I'm struggling to find inventive new ways to like encourage people to vote. Cause I feel like, you know, you, just posting another selfie being like, vote is like, just everyone's like, duh, you know? <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'm gonna like do a combo of like some slutty bathroom pics plus like my little like online portal that said like your mail-in ballot has been accepted by your board of elections and like, thank you for voting. Um, and so I like, you know, took my little like undie, like I just hiked up my dress and took like little undie with my leg on the counter kind of pick and was like, you know, what's really sexy? Voting, you know, it turns me on fighting fascism via a flawed democratic process. Like, you know, um, and so <laughs> even that I was just like, I, I, just, I just have felt overcome with the kind of uh, slutty internet performance recently that has really brought me a lot of bliss and, and helped me be in my body in a way that uh, it's easy to lose track of. So that's a long ass answer, but here it is. I love that answer and I'm really grateful for it. I feel like, you know, I don't, it's, this is so hard because we don't get to see anybody's faces. We don't get to see the demographics of folks who are in here, but yeah. I did invite some young queer folks and some young trans people uh, to this event tonight. And something that I wish that I would have learned much, much earlier is that, yeah, without anything on your body you are still completely trans and like you're still fucking with gender and you don't need you don't need anything and like that's I feel like I didn't learn that until very very recently right and right. yeah if there's any tiny queer babies in here a we love you and be that right and and this is maybe a weird metaphor I mean it's not weird for me it might be weird for other people to experience but like I grew up like you know in the church like a Methodist girl or whatever and you know, there are days where I really like to think of trans experience as more of a spiritual practice than anything else, right? Yeah. As a kind of courageous way of, not necessarily that it's like, it's not like a theology per se, but, but, one, but a sort of courageous practice of, of proclaiming the truth of gender to the world, right? And of saying that I'm going to live in that truth and I'm going to live in the fact that, that gender is complicated and variant and beautiful and that gender is not reducible to these, this, this easy hegemony, right? That, that gender is not binary. It's this kind of practice for me. It's like a daily practice. Um, it's not just kind of a one-off thing. It's not just something that I reckon with and I'm done. It's a, it's a practice that I'm gonna keep going for, for my whole life. But in the same way that like, you don't lose your faith because you take off a cross necklace or whatever, right? Like 
you don't you don't lose your transness because you take off your makeup. You don't lose your transness because you take off your binder, right? Mm. Like you get to keep it because it's so much deeper than just a physical manifestation. It's something spiritual and 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 existential and profound that it that that lives in your heart and in your brain first and foremost, and then mm. in your body, and then in all of the wonderful ways that you adorn it. <sighs> I want to throw stuff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. <laughs> Let's throw stuff. <laughs> throw stuff. At um, <laughs> who said that? Luna. <laughs> Luna. Luna says fuck the police, okay? Yeah. In like every language. Literally um, all the dogs say like fuck the police. They're like, please actually stop raiding homes and shooting us. Yeah. What if you stopped? Right. What if we abolished you? What if we just abolished the police? That would be so nice. Anyway, that's a whole other topic. But also not. I mean, if we're talking right. about queer, liber queer, queer liberation and trans liberation, like abolishing the police isn't not. Actually, wait, no, let's go back on this. Let's circle, let's connect this shit because I thought about this. No, so, so when I had to figure out what caption to write for my lewds, right? <laughs> I was trying to figure out like for the beach ones, um, I was trying to figure out like what, why they felt so significant to me? Like, why did feeling, why did being naked on a beach in the Outer Banks in North Carolina, like alone with like no one else around to get us in trouble? Why did that feel so, so meaningful to me? And what I realized is I was like, it's because it's all the, it's like, it's because I am not worried about my body, my gender being policed or my body being policed right? That it's like, we found this magical little strip of beach where there was no one else but us. And it was just me and my friend. And we could be fully present in our bodies without the threat of state violence, mm -hmm. right? That we could, that we could be just naked in a way that like, we didn't have to worry about having the, the like the law, you know, used to criminalize us living in our bodies, right? And that that was actually a really powerful moment for me of like, what an abolitionist world can look like, right? What the, the freedom and the joy that comes with abolition, right? Abolition isn't just fighting against something, it's fighting for joy. It's fighting for a world with like, where we are, where we are free and joyful and live in our power and live in care for one another, right? It's so much more than just trying to get rid of, of, you know, of police and of prisons. And it's, it's so much more about bringing care and, and community and safety back in to roost, you know, like in our own homes and in our own neighborhoods with in, in radical ways that, that, uh, that protect everyone and help everyone live in their joy. And so there's this way in which I had this moment where I was like, wow, I, I, feel, I feel really connected to my body also because the state isn't mitigating it right now. Because like the nearest cop who knows how close they are. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And that was really powerful to be like, I'm miles and miles and miles away from a police officer. In fact, they might've just been on the other side of the sand dunes, but they're never going to drive over them because that would be illegal because it's a state park. Can't drive over sand dunes in a state park. It's a protected area. I feel like those moments of like near utopia, when I experience them, I feel so in my body and I feel mm -hmm. so full of gratitude and it feels like this moment of complete presence. And then there's something about really startling and frightening and, and horrific about coming back to the world and realizing like who has access and how frequently to moments like that where mm -hmm. they aren't released. And like, yeah, I, um, I really appreciate you saying that. Right, and also that like, that, that a significant contributing factor to my access to that freedom in that moment was like, it was still bounded by the fact that if I were navigating North Carolina Outer Banks as, you know, a Black queer person, my experience would have been radically different. Yeah. You know, there's still possibility, of course, there's always possibility, right? There's always potential for joy, but, but it's, it's a different, it's a, it's a, it's a different experience altogether, right? That like being a white passing Arab in that moment came with something else and came with a kind of protection and an ability to kind of blend in quote unquote, or, or, or be for, feel further removed from violence in order to get to the place where I could feel like free from it, which is kind of the paradox of uh, so much of uh, like, like escaping to nature narratives, 
right? Because in order to escape to nature, you often have to navigate through communities that are extremely hostile to all kinds of different people of difference, but especially like in, in a lot of places in the United States, at least hostile to people of color. So yeah. it's like, you know, even that, I'm like, damn, we can't even have that. Yeah. Well, we're going into it tonight. I mean, you know, it's an evening reading. It's your sleepy by the end of the day. You don't have fucks to give. You just say what shit is. No, this is important. I was kind of wondering how we were going to get to this conversation, and I'm just so grateful it happened. Yeah. <laughs> well, when we um, talked to him before this, I was like, we're not even going to have to worry. Like, this is just going to go. Like, we <laughs> seven hours, and we would not be tired. You are a Leo, right? Uh, yes, it's... tragically. <laughs> I was like, I could probably ask one question on the onset, and then just you could talk for about an hour. So I was also not worried about this. Um, <laughs> that was meant as a compliment. I love Leo. I, I, you know, I, I, I try and like just being a Leo, it, it, if, it, if it brings other people joy in a moment, I can hold that. But I also just hold that for me itself is a little bit of an insufferable and excruciating experience. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. It looks like we have some questions. Oh. Oh, okay. Somebody said um, from Noah, I'm a queer middle schooler in a small town and was wondering if there's any advice you have for a baby NB. We love you. Um, I feel like, can we, should, should we both tackle this one? Oh my God. Um, I'll go, can. I can go first if you want, Please. but I'm just saying like, if you have things to weigh in with, I feel like we both have things to share in this regard. Yeah, go, for, you go, 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 go. Well, so the thing is, I don't like, there, there is a peppy answer that is kind of the one where you pave over all the bogs and pretend that, and, and sort of just give the neoliberal polite one where it's like, just be yourself and everything's going to be great, Noah. Um, which I don't do that because I don't like, I don't want to, I want to bullshit you. Um, I want to like actually have a real, um, a real answer for that. And for me, the, the thing I would say about navigating the world as a young NB person, as a young trans person is that your safety and your bodily autonomy and your emotional health matter and are worth protecting. And that you don't owe sacrificing those to anyone. And so I, like what, what I mean by that is that I know that I, especially in my younger life, but, but still today feel this pressure that like I have to do things on behalf of the community. I have to take risks and do things that make me feel unsafe on behalf of the community, right? That I owe it to other people. And in order to be a good trans person or to be a radical NB, right? I have to do, I have to like take on this moment or yell at that person who cat called me or wear a dress, even though I'm scared to wear one today or it, will, you know, it feels hard to get out of the house, right? Like there, there are these moments and these negotiations that you make. And what I've had to learn to do is that it's so important to, to release yourself from that, that burden, right? That, that you have to be the one to educate everyone around you, prove, prove something to everyone around you, um, and, and that you have to play that role at all times because that's exhausting, it's not sustainable, and it's gonna be difficult when legally you don't even have full autonomy yet, right? So I think you know, what I'd say is just, I, I really wanna make sure that you, um, in, in whatever steps you, steps you take toward your joy and toward, your liberation and toward your power, um, take whatever risks feel good for you, absolutely. But if there's a moment where you're like, I don't know if I'm ready to take that risk, it's okay not to take it right now. You're not failing anybody. You're not letting anyone down. We're all still really proud of you. We're all still so happy that you exist. Um, and just because you don't take a risk right now in your younger life does not mean that you forfeit the right to take that risk literally any day thereafter, you know? It's a long, it's a life, it's a, it's a marathon. You don't have to sprint this thing unless you really want to sprint, in which case, and you're a good sprinter, in which case like go. But I'm a spindly, like I'm a spindly queen. So like I did long distance in, in high school when I ran track and cross country because like I'm not built to sprint. So anyway, that's, I guess that's kind of what I would say for now. Um, but I'll turn it over to you. Um, well, you're incredible. And I just, I'm so proud of you. I. I am just astonished at young people who can who come out when they're like seven or eight or in in middle school or mm -hmm. even in high school like I didn't come out until I was like 20 um and I was like as gay and then 
I mean, I'm still kind of coming out as trans to everybody. Hi. Um, <laughs> um, so I am just like astonished at how well you know yourself and how brave you are. And yeah, I think what I want to tell you, and this might sound silly, I mean, might be expected because I'm a bookseller, is like if you don't have books that reflect non-binary and trans characters, like help, let me help you find some or let room or let whoever like help you find some. I feel like um, not being able to see myself reflected in TV and movies and um, and books until I was much, much older in life um, was just harmful. And I feel like there's a lot of growth and like, um, I think, yeah, there's just a lot that could have happened if there'd been more representation. Um, and if the, the representation that I had was horrific and traumatic, you know, like the first time that I, I didn't know that trans people existed until I saw Boys Don't Cry. And I thought that that was like just a movie. I didn't know that it, there was anything queer about it. It was just on TV one day. And like to have this moment where I was just the whole world stood still that I was like, wait, there are other people out here who have the same exact experience. Um, this is this is blowing my mind. And then at the end, the person like gets killed, you know, like, so to have that all happen, like that was traumatic. So I feel like just like stocking up on like positive or just varied um, trans and queer representation um, could be helpful in allowing yourself to feel as possible as you are like now and moving forward. Um, you rule and I think you're doing everything right, so. Yeah. Can I piggyback on that last part too? Yeah. Um, the other thing that I just think is really important to name is that you don't ever need an author's consent to read their character as non-binary, queer, or trans. Yeah. If, That's you know, true. if Gandalf seems like maybe she's a trans woman to you, read it like, read it as such. Here. Right. Yeah. You could, if you want to read this and be like, this is a trans masculine journey, then I'd be like, cool, sure. Like do whatever, read whatever you need to into something to feel affirmed. Like you don't, you don't need an author's consent. You get to read a book. That's, that's the gamble you take when you write one is that people get to read it how they'd like. Yeah. And I feel like thing that picky backing off of that is like, there can be something exhausting about always having to do that. You know, like, yes, oh, yes. clear everything in like kind of like that Mufasa Lion King moment where he's like, everything the light touches is your kingdom. Like everything the light touches, you have 1 billion percent permission to queer. Um, and also like it can be exhausting and to be hypervigilant all the time like that. So, right. and there's right. just so many YA authors right now writing so many like beautiful trans queer stories. Um, yeah, do you think you'll ever write a, a YA novel, Jacob? You know, I, I, think about it but when I think about magic I just think about the heart like or well because for me like when I think about YA I don't I don't want to I wouldn't want to write like a grounded YA <laughs> novel you know like I, I get that that exists but I, I just don't think that's for me I, I just think about magic and I think about fantasy when I think about writing something in the YA space or like or sci-fi and uh and then I just think about the heartbreak of of me having to be like but when 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 does magic enter my life like what like when but like when do I get telekinesis like for real you know what I mean like when do I get so mad that I blow up something with my mind like when is that happening now like when am I brought to like the secret group of like trans witches that like live in the woods in my backyard this whole time you know and so I have to, I think there's a lot of heartbreak I'd have to navigate in order to do that and also revisiting youth and adolescence is something that is uh it's a lot to do um, but I am, but I am working on, I am working on, uh, creating like, cause for me, when I think about, like, I think, I think YA is a genre where I see people doing such good work already, you know, and some, some of, some of the consideration that I make, and I, I could sit here and pretend I'm like a true artist who just feels called to do exactly the medium that they are called to do, um, and is pure in their intention or whatever. But in reality, like, part of what I think about when I think about where to channel my my artistic energy and, and where to go next 
is where are there holes that I like where where are there holes that I can fill, right? Like where where are there crannies or there are nooks? children here? <laughs> where are there nooks or crannies? I just I did I meant it as a metaphor and I didn't even realize it was I, oh, um also I'm not a top. Um I don't know. I'm thinking anyway, um, but like, you know, where where are there places where the work isn't being done and and needs to be, right? And yeah. for me, when I think about like representations of young people, I feel like YA as a genre for years, for a very long time has had incredible queer voices and trans voices like leading within that space and doing the work. And like, it's such a space that is like, that is just, just filled already in, in the best way. Like just with an abundance, like a cornucopia. Um, yeah. Whereas when I think about representations of queer and trans people in the television equivalent of YA, when I think about the representation of queer and trans people in high school, in film and TV, I'm like, it's trash. You know, like it's just a garbage fire. There's so little. And when it's there, it's so caricatured. It's so underwrought or overwrought, but never just properly wrought, you know? And, <laughs> and, it's, and, and there's so much work that needs to be done. And so that's actually kind of one of the things I'm working on now is like, I'm, I'm channeling that energy, the sort of YA energy more into like the screen, my screenwriting practice. Um, and into what would it mean for me to create a show that A, just has a, trans person as the main character of a show that occurs in a high school right yeah. not a side character not a best friend you know not like the gay person who happens to be president of the drama club and is sassy or whatever right like like but it's actually centered on like the trans girl it is her story and then everyone else is peripheral to her instead yeah. of it being the other way around and I might have maybe made some big strides toward that, but they're not strides I'm allowed to talk about publicly yet. Oh. And I hate to be that girl, but I also love to be her. So <laughs> I'm so sorry, but also like, and, and I'll let y'all know, like I'll let y'all know when I can let y'all know. And it might just be me saying womp womp, it didn't happen because TV development takes like years and is always a crapshoot. So, but other and there's people- a pandemic. Right. Not helping. Yeah, um, not helping not helping oh noah said i don't even know what to say this is amazing thank you both so much oh, <laughs> Group oh hug, we noah. don't know what to say no. oh, i'm so sad we're not in person because i mean maybe it maybe it was easier for you to access this because we weren't in person but still there would be a hug maybe there's a hug in the future yeah or like um, a cute high five or elbow bump a little bump yeah i love elbow um, bumps even before <laughs> pandemic, I loved an elbow bump. You, uh, I have a lot of questions that we could go into. Um, I remember when we were talking earlier, you were talking about how writing the, uh, the memoir was like easily the heal most healing thing you've done for yourself and that releasing it to the world and having to go into publishing was potentially like the most harmful thing that you mm. had to do. And I'm wondering if you could talk more about that. Um, yeah. And or... How is screenwriting uh, different from writing the memoir or do they feel similar? Um, I'll answer the first question first because I feel like I have a kind of cute pithy answer for that. And then we'll circle around to, the, to like the, the meatier one. Although I shouldn't use that metaphor because I'm vegetarian. So like the more fibrous one, the more fibrous mm -hmm. one, <laughs> the one with more roughage. Um, anyway, so, you know, for me, the difference between screenwriting and, and memoiring, um, is not that huge because my writing practice pretty much exclusively occurs uh, in cafes and coffee shops um, because I just I just am not good at doing things in the house, which has made pandemic a little interesting. I've had to really work on that and like do like find ways of creating scarcity of time. You know, like I've had to, but but in general, I still write like to write in coffee shops or cafes. And there are a few you know coffee shops near me in North Carolina that have like outdoor seating where that are far away from people, where I've like been able to kind of safely post up. Um, and you know, for me, the main difference between memoir and screenwriting in that context is just in one situation when I'm screenwriting, I'm talking to myself pretty loudly in public um, because you have to hear what you're saying. Like you have to hear it. Like care, you know, memoir like. Like you can't write in a verb, like in a verbose way for screenwriting. Like you have to write how you actually speak. Um, so I have to talk it out. So I'm just like talking to myself, like just just very flagrantly, just with no shame. Um, whereas with memoiring, I'm I'm not talking to myself. I'm either just kind of 
I'm alternating between giggling uncontrollably and like sobbing openly in public. So it's just kind of, you know, it's just, it's just about sort of which way I appear dysregulated in public. <laughs> it's really the difference between the two types of writing for me. Um, and make of that what you will. Um, but yeah, to the, to the first point, I, I, I have always said, and I will continue to say that, that writing this book um, was one of the most healing things I've done in my life because there is just something so powerful and therapeutic about centering yourself as the protagonist of your own life, right? Like I, I don't, and I know that that sounds really simple, but it's actually something most of us don't practice every day. Like most of us don't think of ourselves as like, I am, I'm the protagonist of this experience in this moment as I'm living it, mm -hmm. right? Um, I deserve the empathy and the understanding and the context that comes with being a protagonist in a moment like this. I'm allowed to be flawed and should be flawed in the way that every good protagonist is, right? There's this really radical potential of self-love that, that comes when you start to think of yourself as a protagonist and especially in the context of a world where we aren't given many protagonist representations of ourselves to, mm. just to begin with, right? And we didn't grow up watching trans or queer or non-binary people on television like us, making us feel seen and helping us tap into that sense of protagonism. Um, so there was something so powerful about putting it all together. And, and, and then the other part that was really healing about it was that I made the commitment to myself that I would never, that like just tonally, I, I had to, for my own mental health, and I think for the, for the sake of the project too, I think it, I think it does give it something. Um, I, was, I had to find the joke in every story. Like I couldn't, no story, like there was no story that was hard enough or sad enough that I couldn't find the joke in what was happening or at least find the comedy in the moment. So like, for example, when I wanted to give a big talk to my youth group at my church about how Jesus made me gay and maybe made you gay too. Um, and my youth group pastor had to sort of sit me down and be like, you, you can't do that, right? Like, and it was, it was actually a heartbreaking moment that like shattered me as a human being. But in order to do, in order to give me that talking to, and, and if I just written it as a shattering moment, then it would have been like, oh, um, well, dang. And then that would have been it, right? But I was like, I'm gonna push myself to find the comedy because in order to do that, I have to float above this moment and see it from a full perspective and from a new perspective, which is how one heals, I'm convinced. Um, and so I, of course I realized, I was like, wait, he literally took me to the Wendy's that was across the street from our church, bought me a Frosty, and then told me that I couldn't say that in church. Like he used a Frosty as, my, as the hush money. And that, my friends, is hilarious because when you're in like a freshman in high school or you're like in high school, a frosty is pretty much hush money, you know? <laughs> like you're like, I would do a lot for a milkshake when you're in high school. <laughs> Cause like, you know, you're not loaded with cash when you're in high school. Like milkshakes are not a very you can't just go buy one any day you want. Right. Um so so you know like finding those little those little nuggets like that that part, there's something about letting myself laugh at just that facet of it that just puts these little stitches somewhere in these little breaks in your heart and just like yeah. sutures them together in some kind of way. So, um, so yeah, that part was, uh, was really, um, really helpful and really wonderful. And then, yeah, publishing a book and putting it up for critical consumption um, uh, and watching a market respond to it uh, was devastating. And, and, and I say that only because I, and, and, you know, maybe this is giving away too much. Maybe this is saying too much, but I overshare everything. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, friends. Um, sorry. But like when I was crafting this book, the, the craft of the thing, right? Like the real intellectual work for me of this piece was writing a book that could be held, that could be like just the longest, widest bridge possible, right? I wanted to write something that my, neighbors like neighborhood moms from growing up could read feel seen in 
feel like feel like everything was explained to them enough, but they weren't patronized, you know, that they got it, that they could connect to it, that all of a sudden this idea of like non-binary millennials and Gen Z and like trans people being mad about stuff or whatever stopped being this kind of like scary abstract thing and turned into a person that I know who likes me and who I like, right? Like, and, and an experience that I actually have a pretty technical understanding of on the other side uh, and, and an emotional and empathetic understanding of on the other side of this, right? I wrote it for them as much as I wrote it for all the sweet baby queers and like baby trans folks who I know could probably use this as a resource and could, and, and because I know I would have loved to read a book like this when I was younger, right? And, and for like, you know, the, uh, also for, uh, just for all the, all the queers and the trans folks and everybody, right? Um, and especially for people of trans feminine experience or, or the folks who were called SEs growing up who maybe don't even realize that that qualifies them to be part of trans feminine experience, um, for them to help heal. And the thing about putting it out into the marketplace was really realizing that there is an entire group of gatekeepers who refuse to let it reach so many of the people that it could have, who, who's, whose hearts and minds it could have really affected, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so you get disappointed about sales numbers, but it has nothing to do with making money. For me, it was, it, it was I just find it devastating that, that this, I don't think that this book made it to like the moms of America. You know what I mean? And the reason I'm sad about that is because I don't feel like I am not okay with the idea that as non-binary people or trans people, we just have to wait for an entire generation to die out before we can feel safe in this world. I refuse those terms. Those are not acceptable terms to me. And I feel that like in this book, I've crafted something that could really help move the clock forward on some of that and ensure that we could maybe even build like build community with some of those folks and, and create that safety and, and that sense of community a little bit earlier, right? And the fact that he, that it that it didn't get there yet, which yet is an operative word here, um, yeah. but yet like and watching people stone sort of stonewall me out of things, right? Like my publicist just not never getting a call back from People Magazine, just you know like like she like works with people all the time for all a bunch of her clients and just could not get me in that magazine to save my to save her life. You know what I mean? And it's like why? Well, because people think that this like weird trans feminine and non-binary. I could use more derogatory language is too out there, right? Or is 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 um, going to scare off their readers or whatever? And and watching watching that happen over and over and over and over again in so many ways, um, I mean, it really does a number on your heart. Yeah. So, and then also just watching New Yorker editors or whoever, like all those like 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 literary intelligentsia types, be petty and not appreciate populist or accessible literature that like is meticulously and surgically designed, I would like to say, um, also pisses me off. But that's like a separate and much more petty kind of vendetta that we will work out one day. I'm here for petty. I think most of us are. Um, I do want to say like in reading this, I did think of like my second mom. I thought of her mother. I thought of like um, the people in my life who have shown that they love and support me and they really do want to understand. Um, but like, they, this just is like a whole new language. It's a whole, mm. you know, um, they're learning something completely new. And I, and I was thinking about this book, not only would they enjoy, but it's accessible. You're right. It doesn't like talk down to them. Um, so that's who I'm giving this one to. And if there's anybody in the chat who like has a mom or an aunt or has a partner or a best friend who has a mom or an aunt or an uncle or anybody who like is trying um but just needs just needs the right book i i do as a bookseller believe that this is that book um so yeah i think that yet is the word i'm also seeing these comments and from beth who said my sister is trans and i'm gonna send this to our mom it will get there and then jesse who said it made it to mo many moms of trans kids already that wow oh oh <sighs> okay Sometimes this is why you have to complain about things too, because sometimes you have it in your head that something has failed in a specific way. And then you just need to say that like, this is what my brain is telling me. And then people are like, darling baby girl, like yeah. get in touch with reality a little bit more. You sweet baby angel. Yeah, You're I'm wrong. gonna turn up over here. This is wild. Okay, cool. Oh, 
Well, so on the back of your book, you have a blurb from both Alan Cumming and Miss J. Alexander. And I'm just like wondering how one does that. Okay. <laughs> wow. Okay. So, um, so, so I'm trying, so the, so the, the Alan Cumming blurb came because I lived, so I lived in New York for a number of years before. So I grew up in North Carolina. I am, let, let's be very clear. Like I am suburban Southern trash, like through and through. And I just need everyone to know that. Like I'm a, I'm a country mouse. Um, and I go to the city and I'm just kind of like, you know, like I, I like pretend like I'm figuring, but I, I don't really know what I'm doing. Um, but when I lived in New York, uh, I, I did sort of like there, you know, I, I, I found some like my gunkles, you know, cause I feel like every time, I feel like whenever you move to the city, you need like, if you move to a new city, you need to find like some chosen family for yourself. Um, and the, some, my chosen family folks, um, they, they like were friends with Alan. And so I met him at their, well, I mean, cause like, cause I mean like the New York gay mafia is a thing, okay? Like it's a real thing and it's not that hard to like infiltrate. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like it really isn't, I don't think it is. I, I think if you just have to, you just have to like want to do that, which I think that most people don't like, and, and also probably like you have to like move there which is a traumatic experience um, and one I'm not sure I'd recommend. So anyway, long story short, um, I met Alan very briefly at a holiday party once and then like never saw him again. And then randomly ran into him on the street and was like, oh, hey. And I was like, he's not gonna remember me. And he was like, oh, hey. And then I was like, no shit, that worked. <laughs> what the fuck? Um, and then after that, like, you know, from there I was, I was able to like get connected. Cause when you need to get blurbs for a book you literally think about like, okay that one friend that I know who went to college with that other girl who went, whose mom is the literary agent of uh, that one author who is friends with that other author who I want to get to. Like you mine your network that deeply to get to all these people because it's really hard, it takes forever. Um, but I honestly would say that if, if I could go back in, in time, I'd be like, maybe try a little less hard on that, Jacob. It's, it's important, but it is not that important. Um, yeah. but yeah, so that was, that was how that one came together. And then I'm trying to remember where I met Miss J first. It was at some sort of New York gala situation. That's how you meet all these folks. You just have to get an invite to a gala, which, you know, like you can weasel your way into a lot of shit in New York. If you, if you're a weasel and <laughs> I guess I'm a non-binary weasel. I literally like the, I, the, within a year of first moving to New York, I just realized like, oh, you can just crash red carpets with enough, like with enough confidence. If you just show up in like some interesting sequins and say like, hi, I'm, I'm here to walk the carpet. And then they're like, oh. And then you're like, yeah, my name's Jacob today. And they're like, oh, 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 okay. And then they just write your name down because they're panicked and they feel like they should have known who you were. And then you just walk over there and take your little photos. And then you're like, cool. Like you can you <laughs> your way into almost anything. And that's my inspiring message of tonight. I do just like for everyone in the chat, I want you to, to remind you that Jacob is a Leo who is saying that you can just weasel your way into red carpets in New York and that like some expectations aren't fair for other signs. And also I do believe in all of you that you can do that. I but... just think that everyone is capable of bullshitting, but you have to bullshit in the way that is commensurate with your sign. Yeah, sure. That There's could be the bullshitting next strategies based on who you are and sort of how you navigate the world energetically. But each yes. person can find a bullshitting strategy that can work for you. <laughs> um, in the chat, uh, Emily says, I constantly look for books to give to my family and loved ones to build that bridge. So thank you. And Kana Liv said my mom would read the F out of this. So Y'all are, are just making my whole life right now. Trying to make Jacob cry. Um, okay, so it's 9.25. Does any, I want to, get another uh, question from you all if you have one. I am gonna ask Jacob one more question until some more questions come in. I have a second question if there are no more questions. Um, but I'm wondering like, who are your gender beacons right now? Like, who are you looking toward for strength and inspiration? And like, what other queerdos uh, in the world are keeping you feeling safe, sane, beautiful, abundant? Um, I could, say that like right now I'm centering other people in my inspiration, um, but that's just, that wouldn't be fully honest in this moment. Um, right now I am 
uh, I'm while I've been in North Carolina, I've been really getting in touch with like my sort of inner bird and or crow um, and just picking up shiny rocks when I see shiny rocks. And I've been really, and like, I actually have a bunch of them back there, but I can't, I don't know if I can go crab. Um, like I just have all these little pieces of quartz that just look, they're not like, like crystals, right? They're just like little chunks of quartz. They look like nothing. But when you, when the light catches them right on the path as you're walking by, you see that little glint and you just sort of think maybe that's one of them and you pick it up and it's just this little like sort of white or grayish rock. But then when the sun hits it just right, you get that magical little prism moment inside where there's like a full ass rainbow inside of the rock. And that is what is inspiring me these days. It's just little rocks that just, I feel like contain the whole universe inside of them. And <laughs> um, that is the strangest answer I've ever given to that question. But uh, <laughs> the most honest, I think is I'm, I'm inspired by little rocks right now. I love that answer. <laughs> I needed that answer. Um, Go Sky walk around said, and pick up little rocks, everybody, and look at them really carefully, and you'll realize that all the rocks are queer. Always have. Oh, Mother Nature is queer. Rocks are gay. Pass yeah. it along. The world is trans. <laughs> um, Sky says, I like to say that I've never read a book that I could relate to more, and I really felt seen, and just thank you. Oh, Sky. The Sky is also trans. Deeply. <laughs> Um, it's 927. Oh. Yeah. Oh, is thinking? there, oh, is that, is that a question that we, is that the one you just asked? What have you been reading during the pandemic that brings you joy? A little different, but we are, I love that we're all on this little, uh, joy thing. Um, I have an answer for that one. Um, Give it to us. so I'm reading a book by, uh, which it's weird because it's not necessarily like an author I'd usually gravitate towards, but I'm reading a book by Michael Pollan called How to Change Your Mind. Um, yeah. And it's, I don't know if folks have heard of it or not, but it's all about um, the history of psychedelics in the United States specifically, right? It doesn't, it doesn't delve too deeply into like their indigenous history or their history of indigenous cultures around the world. It, it touches on that, but it's much more sort of looking specifically at the initial surge of interest in terms of psych, uh, psychedelics as psychiatric medicine in the 50s and 60s, the moral panic that sort of followed in the 60s, like in the 70s and, and 80s, and then sort of their resurgence, their sort of quiet resurgence um, in the uh, sort of early 2000s and to the present day. Um, and I've been looking into that because, and, and that book has really been bringing me a lot of joy because it, it comes with a real sense of possibility around my own mental health. Um, you know, cause I've, I mean, like, LOL, Avi, like, I, you know, I've dealt with like mental health stuff. I've, I've dealt with some pretty intense depression at various points in my life. Um, and I also have this real gut sense that like queer trauma hardwired a lot of shit in my brain that, that shouldn't be there. Right. Yeah. That like, that like there are, there's hardwiring that got altered by my trauma. Right. And, and there's a lot of scientific evidence to support that that's how trauma works in the brain. Um, and so reading about psychedelics and how they work neurologically and what they do for your brain and how they reconnect neural pathways and reimagine your brain inside itself, right? Like that there are these, that there are these magical little plants that can like help you talk to God in, and of which I have now sampled once and had a really profound, incredible moving experience that was so deeply trans and so much about, um, violence and fear of violence because of my body and my identity and 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 a serenity that sort of like it came and answered that like I just it's been giving me a real sense of futurity in this moment around like there is so much yet for me to try in terms of helping myself feel whole in this world there is still mm -hmm. so much that we do not know about our own brains and about how to um, connect with joy and heal our trauma and there is so much more for me to do um, and that sense of futurity is joy for me right now, because sometimes it feels like we have no future in this moment. And I'm like, no, 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 we got a future. It's bright. It's awesome. We're going to get there. And I'm not saying that as some neoliberal trash garbage. I'm saying that because like, we're going to fight like hell for it. And once we get there, it's going to be worth it. Yeah. I think that's a perfect note to end on. <laughs> Thank you so, so psychedelics, much. everybody. <laughs> my next book will be about my mushroom trips. Oh. <laughs> uh. Connor. Hi. Are we done? Well, Michonne said we were done. I think that uh, okay. I want to trust their I instincts. 
Uh, thought, that was. I thought nine thirty was. No, no, it was nine thirty, yes. and you picked the perfect moment. Yeah, oh my yeah. gosh! Like it's That's... exactly nine thirty. We did a great job. Yeah, Look at you. It was spot on. Extraordinary. Absolutely, absolutely spot on. Um, yeah, and I just want to say thank you so much, Jacob. Thank you so much, Michan. This was exactly um, perfect. Quite, quite possibly, you know. Couldn't couldn't write it better. So thank you very much. I have and thank one you. more thing I have to say oh, before we finish. Go right. Ahead. I forgot to say I got these earrings, this matching earring set in Wisconsin at the Elkhorn Flea Market. Oh. I bought these earrings for eighty five cents and this necklace for I think of eighty five cents as well out of an egg sh out of egg carton at Elkhorn. I just needed everyone to know that. I forgot. Anyway, okay. We needed to know that. That's great. It's thank all about you. Wisconsin so many here at the Wisconsin Book Festival. Um, I want to say thank you to all of the people watching at home. Um, this has been just an absolutely incredible hour of um, listening to Jacob discuss their book, Sissy. Um, please do as we told you, buy it um, from a room of one's own. You can click the green box at the bottom of your screen. Michonne will wrap it up and send it directly to you. That will be... I will write a note in it for oh, you. There you go. There you go, Noah. Um, I also want to encourage people that this concludes the second day of this year's fall celebration. We have eight more events tomorrow, um, starting at 10 a.m. and running until 9.30 p.m. tomorrow. So we hope to see you all back here um, for another eight great events of Wisconsin Book Festival content. And then we have 11 events um, throughout the fall after that. So a lot more free cultural events from the Wisconsin Book Festival this fall. Thank you again, Jacob and Michan. Have a lovely day. And thank okay. you, Luna as well for yes. taking part. <laughs> Perfect. Bye, y'all. All right. Bye. Bye. Good night, everybody. Good night.